Welcome to True Crime Review, an unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes, so listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to episode 5 of True Crime Review. I am, uh, I'm sorry, first of all, I'm going to say right from the top for having skipped a week. Um, I, episode 4.5 was a 911 call. It was uh, a call from the Sean Great case, which I'll do an update about in this episode um, uh, in a bit. But... Um, I was doing those uh, episodes, I was thinking of doing those episodes every every other week to give myself more time to research um, and outline the, the bigger episodes. Um, so I ended up re- really falling into the rabbit hole, especially with regard to uh, the last case we're going to talk about, um, uh, the cold case of the, the murder of Scarlett Keeling. And um, so I will talk more about that a little bit later, but I I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I don't intend to make that a habit. Um, I'd like to have an episode every week, and I'd like to have um, a deeply researched episode like this one every other week. So I am going to try and make that happen. Um, A second item I want to mention at the top here is a correction on the Victoria Martins murder. Uh, Victoria Martins was um, murdered by several people, her, her mother, her mother's boyfriend, and I think the boyfriend's cousin. Um, I'll remind you that her, her mother set up several rapes uh, of Victoria, including the one that culminated in her murder. Uh, and that I'll also remind you she told authorities, the mother did, that she enjoyed watching these rapes occur. Uh, I originally told you that um, the three suspects pled uh, guilty, uh, and I was wrong and gave them way too much credit. They, in fact, have all pled not guilty, and we'll have an update uh, on that case with some more detail, but I just wanted to get that out at the top, that uh, they have pled not guilty, and I erroneously reported to you previously that they had um, pled guilty. And just sort of as a follow-up to that, I do want to tell you that I've had, again, great criticism. I've had positive reviews, and I've had negative reviews, and all of the reviews have included some form of advice on how to make the show better, which I, you know, I couldn't ask for better, for better reviews, I really couldn't. Um, So I am taking them to heart. And one of the results of me taking those reviews and those criticisms to heart is we're going to cover just two or three news stories uh, in each in each larger episode, so I can give a fuller background and a fuller update on uh, you know what happened to the victim and what the case is and things like that, instead of sort of just skimming over and kind of leaving listeners wondering you know what the hell happened here uh, and having to go off on their own. Uh, I'm gonna do a fewer stories in greater depth, and hopefully that will that will help improve the listener experience um, and, and improve my experience as well. Because I am doing this at the end of the day because I, I am a listener, and I, I think I'm subscribed to, to, to over a hundred true crime podcasts of various types. So I understand what makes a good episode, and the question is just how do I make sure that I I do those things uh, for you guys. So. Okay, moving on to the news. I'm um, going to do a more in-depth update here about Victoria Martin's. Uh, Victoria Martin's killers, again, her mother, her mother's boyfriend, and her mother's boyfriend's cousin, um, 
will go on trial in October of 2017, about a year from when you're listening to this episode. I think it'll actually start October 3rd. Um, newscasters, though, recently obtained both police interview transcripts and 911 audio. Um, but I could not find the audio files themselves or the transcripts. I could only find stories quoting the transcripts or um, including bits of the 911 audio in video segments. Um, so if I do find them uh, sort of unadulterated, unmixed, uh, I will post them and I will let everybody know. And I'm hoping if you find them out there, uh, you will let me know, either at podcast at truecrimereview.net uh, or somewhere on social media. Um, But here's an excerpt from the news article about the transcripts, and I will include a link to this article so you can go ahead and read uh, the rest of it for yourself. She, and by she the article means uh, Martin's mother, Victoria Martin's mother. She told detectives she watched Gonzalez and Kelly sexually assault Victoria at least three times in in the days before the murder. She also said she suspected Gonzalez had been sexually assaulting her daughter for a month while Miss Martins was at work. One detective asks, This time she died and you weren't ready for the type of animals these people were. And Miss Martins replied, Yes, but I should have stopped it. She then told police she enjoyed watching men have sex with Victoria. She admitted to letting two other men have sex with her daughter over the past six month, months, and she named both of them. Albuquerque police will not say if those two men have been questioned. And that ends the quote from the article. I think it's safe to assume uh, that those men have been questioned. I wouldn't even be surprised if they were in custody, although there's no reports of that yet. And I further wouldn't be surprised, uh, just based on what I know of the criminal justice system if they are working on some sort of uh, plea deal to, to, uh, in return for any evidence that they can give authorities uh, to help the case, uh, solidify the case against Victoria's mom and her other murderers. Maybe they don't need these, these two other um, uh, pedophiles. Uh, testimony to, to bury these individuals, but um, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were in custody, and I, sh- I certainly hope they're in custody because they, you know, they are uh, obvious criminals as well. Uh, so again, one of the stories I'm really going to keep a close eye on, Victoria Martins, um, was found. Uh, in case you don't remember, this is your first episode. Uh, she was found after her mother and the other individuals involved in her murder um, sought out uh, help from neighbors uh, to call 911. Um, The killing was sort of done during meth binge and culminated in in her strangling and uh, subsequent stabbing and eventually they dismembered her, they removed her arms and uh, put her uh, body, wrapped her body in a carpet put the carpet in the bathtub and set it on fire. Um, you know, so we obviously want to make sure that we, we follow up with this story and, um, and hopefully see these individuals um, put in, in prison for this. The next news update is uh, related to episode 4.5 and that is the case of Sean Great, who... Um, you recall, if you do listen to 4.5, if you haven't listened to it yet, I really recommend you uh, listen to it after you're done with this episode. It is about 20 minute long 911 call from a woman who was abducted by Sean Great and kept against her will with Sean Great and actually used his burner phone to call authorities and tell them that she had been kidnapped uh, while he was sleeping in the same room with her. And it's a harrowing 911 call, which does, uh, thankfully, end with her rescue and his arrest. So, um, 
Updating on that case, Sean Great was recently charged with 23 counts, including two counts of murder and one count of kidnapping. Uh, he has uh, been linked primarily by, by himself and his own words to authorities to as many as five murders. I think the count still, uh, still is that. For all we know, it could increase. We don't know. Um, again, listen to episode 4.5. You can hear the 911 call from the woman who survived and got arrested. She's still unnamed, or I would be using her name. I'd like to use victims' names instead of perpetrators' names in my headings and in referring to the case because I think, um, you know, a big mission of True Crime Review is to, you know, contribute to finding truth for families, contribute to giving uh, voices to victims who frequently get overshadowed by the, uh, the public's curiosity about, you know, the abnormal psychology of the individuals who perpetrate these crimes. Um, but this survivor is um, currently anonymous. We do know the names of Great's alleged murder victims. So Stacy Stanley and Elizabeth Griffin were both found dead in September, uh, shortly following Great's arrest. Uh, Candace Cunningham was found in, in June 2016. Um, Rebecca Lisi was found in March of 2015, and uh, an as of yet unidentified woman um, was found dead in 2005. Uh, she had been selling magazines door to door and had apparently failed to deliver the magazines the great's mother had ordered, which ultimately led him to murder her. Um, I'm going to read some excerpts from letters that great. Uh, the first letter, and this is a quote from the article that will be in the show notes. Uh, discussing the letters, Great's first letter responded to a request uh, from the reporter to whom he sent the letter, uh, asking for an on-camera interview, and he said, quote, that sounds scary and facing myself even more. The mirror has been enough, but having even more questions hitting me straight on could and would only help to understand me better. Unquote. Now, I am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but that screams narcissist to me, uh, right? This does not look like an opportunity to him to apologize or to explain himself in any real way. Um, this looks like an opportunity for attention. Um, even in jail, even alone, he is uh, looking in the mirror, he's saying. Um, so just my, uh, my two cents on that. Now, from his second letter, he tries to go into the motives. Quote, they were already dead. Just their bodies were flopping wherever it can flop, but their minds were already dead. Exclamation point. The state took their minds once they started receiving their monthly checks. Unquote. Great said government assistance took his victims' minds. He said he applied for government assistance five years ago and received $197 on a food card that he used for a year and a half. He found work making handcrafted signs. Quote, never was able to receive any encouragement, though many bodies received 700 Unquote. Great uses the words people, bodies, and victims interchangeably. So, again, more two cents from me uh, on the topic I have no expertise in. Uh, it sounds to me like he's trying to... Uh, he's very cold about this. He's very um, dissociative uh, and doesn't seem to want to uh, discuss dealing with uh, individuals as individuals. So... The reaction of authorities to this reporter uh, reaching out to them and saying, I have these letters that Sean Great has sent me. Uh, do you want to look at them for consideration as evidence? And this is another passage from the article. Quote, do what you want with the letters, unquote, a member of the support staff in the DA's office said over the phone. 
In a subsequent email, Special Assistant Prosecuting Attorney Mark Weaver told News 5 that support staff is not authorized to speak to the press. Quote, if you have evidence or letters from Sean Gray that you want to provide to law enforcement, please submit copies to our office and we will review them for potential use in prosecution. Unquote. Uh, so, while I was doing research, uh, I came across those, uh, that story about the letters. I did email. Uh, her name is Megan Hickey. She works for News 5, a uh, local um, TV station there, and she was the one who reached out asking for an interview. And I was asking if she was going to release PDFs of the letters from Great, and she said that she was very nice. Uh, she sent me back a brief reply that said that her, the, the station's attorneys had really advised them to sit on the letters until they knew for sure what the DA wants to do with them from an evidentiary standpoint. Um, she did not uh, directly foreclose the possibility of releasing them if and when the DA decides that they're not going to use them as evidence. Um, so I will follow up with her when anything comes out in the news about that and, and hopefully uh, at some point, as long as it's not going to damage the state's case against Great, we will get PDFs of those letters because I have, uh, it sounds like from the articles that they will give uh, great insight into the mind of this monster. Um, and I'm certainly looking forward to being able to uh, read those. And now this is information that came out um, very recently while I was preparing for this episode. On October 7th, uh, News 19, which is a CBS affiliate in Cleveland, uh, and these murders occurred uh, in Ohio, in and around Ashland, Ohio. Um, and they did a, a, an interview from the Ashland County Jail uh, with Great on uh, Friday, October 7th. Um, during the interview, I'm going to read you uh, essentially a reconstructed interview transcript um, from an interview uh, performed by Cleveland 19's senior producer of investigations, Cassie Nist, uh, who visited Great in jail personally on Friday, October 7th. Now, uh, she was not allowed to bring in any recording devices, so the back and forth Q&A is a transcription that she produced from memory. It's not verbatim, but, but I would imagine that a lot of what this guy said probably stuck in her mind. So we're going to go, I'm going to read through the whole thing without commenting and then, um, and then maybe uh, talk about it a little bit. Uh, I think that you'll, it'll be clear to you who the questioner is and, and when great is answering, but for the first question, we'll name them. Yeah, so News 19 says, anything you would like to say before we get started? Great. I'm learning this was out of behavior for me. I had to cover everything up. It was tearing me up all those years, knowing what I'd done. I'd have these thoughts like, dang, I had to face myself every day. Were there any influences that you were exposed to, like the show Dexter? What's that? It's a show about a forensic scientist for the Miami Police Department, and when the bad guys get away, he is a vigilante and kills them. Great replied, I never heard about it. I didn't have any influences. It was all internalized. I feel like I always prayed to God. It's hard to forgive yourself. You have your moments. Let's talk about these women. You confessed to murdering a woman in 2005, believed to be named Dana or Diane. She was trying to sell me magazines. I remember her trying to sell them to me. Me and my mom would be on the porch and she'd try to sell them. My mom said she wasn't getting her subscriptions delivered. What was her name, Dana or Diane? I know you admitted to Marion County Sheriff Tim Bailey that her name was Dana or Diane. Dana. I would say Dana, 99%. What happened with that? She came to the house and tried to tell me that she would pay for half of the subscription and if I paid the other half. 
I could tell she was scheming me. How did you kill her? So there's a pretty big gap between Dana in 2005 and the next woman in 2015. What was going on during that time? Great said, I was in jail for a child support case, in and out of jail. How many kids do you have? Three. One with Steph, a daughter named Kale. She's 18 or 19 now. She's remarried. A son named Dylan who lives with my mom. He plays football. He's 17. Oh really, what position? They move him around to different positions a lot. What about your third kid? Violet, she's four. That's a great age. Have any of your kids visited you since all this went down? No. What about Rebecca Lisi? The coroner ruled that to be drug related. I knew Rebecca. One day we were out playing pool at a bar and I went to use the restroom and heard my money clip zip. She'd stolen four dollars from me. But the coroner rules it an overdose. She was on something. She was a prostitute. Let's talk about Candace Cunningham. You two were dating? For how long? Was she pregnant? No, she wasn't pregnant. We were seeing each other for about seven months. She was pretty violent and suicidal. I turned her into a psych ward for a week. Then we fought at the house in Richland for three to four days. Then the next day we'd get up and go for walks. She could have run off and told police at any time. She would take hand pill handfuls of pills at a time and I would give her the water. How did you kill her? In the house. Then you burned down the house and went back for her body. Why? I had to hide her. Now the next woman, Elizabeth Griffith. How did you meet her? At the Croc Center. We would hang out and play games. Yahtzee, right? I think I read that in a report. Yeah, and some other games too. What happened with her? Why kill her? I'm trying to justify it as compassion. The short time I talked to her since she cried several times, just about life and how she couldn't find anyone to love her. She had a mental illness. Candace was beating herself up too. They tried to put me on psych pills, but I didn't want anything controlling my brain. Are you remorseful? It's about 50-50. All I wanted to do was show Elizabeth that she wanted to live. I'd say, give me a hug, we're all in this together. And I'd choke her until she said she wanted to live. And she just didn't. What about the woman you abducted who called 911? Did you meet her at Stone Creek Apartments along with, Eliz along with Elizabeth too? Yeah. That girl and I, her name is redacted in, in the report. We were going to get married. I wasn't going to kill. She was very religious. She encouraged people, helped to see who they were. I would play badminton with her at Stone Creek Apartments and Elizabeth would be there. Was she helping you? Yes. Are you religious? I feel I've always been religious. How about Stacy Stanley? Did you just see she had a flat tire and that was how you met her? Yeah. Did you ever tell anyone that you had killed women before? Yeah, in ways. I broke down crying for a long time to a few different women. Then I'd say something to confuse them. Are you a sex addict? Sex is a weakness, but you have control over it. So you've confessed. Why not plead guilty in court? instead of not guilty. I admitted it. I told my attorney that if he said it again in court that I'd speak up. Have you killed anyone else or just the five? Why not admit to it all at this point? No, there were just five. Let me see our list. And at this point, the reporter holds up the list of victims to the glass.
Yeah, there were five, Grade said. Are you afraid of the death penalty? I admitted it. I feel I deserve the death penalty. But I also feel I can help some people in here. My problem is that everyone is telling me what to do. I'm just trying to free myself of what I've done. I'm afraid of the death penalty. I will have cases in Richland here and Marion and there's time. I'd like to die on my own and not by the state. My attorneys keep telling me not to talk to anyone. I don't need you. I'm guilty. Is there any statement that you would like to release to the public or to the victims' families, the loved ones that are missing the victims? I'd like to ask those who know me to forgive me and the victims' families, the loved ones that are missing the victims. Anything else you'd like to say? My bunkmate is crazy. He's an F3 or F4 registered offender. Have you ever messed around with kids? No, I like older women, except for Candace. She was younger, but more of a friend. Thank you for your time. Great reply, thank you. And that concluded the interview. Um, the article is it's definitely a fascinating read. I'm going to make sure a link is in the show notes. I'm not always comfortable reading that much from somebody else's work, but the guy um, is just so absurd at this point to be uh, going into court, letting his attorney plead not guilty for him, and then um, you know just seeming to, to revel in the attention. And to me, an interview like this is, it doesn't really happen that often. And it's really just kind of a fascinating insight into what is going on with this this kind of a, a, a monstrous person. Um, so definitely going to keep an eye on this case. Um, it's going to move forward. I'm not sure where it's going to end up. Um, yeah, but something tells me that it's going to be a little bit more complicated than a simple open and shut going to trial with a confession sending somebody to jail or to death row. Next is the really sad story of Erica Lynn Parsons. Uh, Erica Lynn Parsons was born on February 28th, 1998 in North Carolina and was adopted at birth by Sandy and Casey Parsons, relatives of her biological mother. Her brother reported her missing on July 30th, 2013, uh, telling authorities after he had a fight with his parents that he had not seen Erica since November of 2011. Let me say that one more time. He reported her missing on July 30th, 2013, telling authorities he had not seen her since November 2011. He also told police his parents killed Erica and buried her in their backyard, but later retracted that statement. Her parents told police Erica had gone to live with her paternal grandmother, Irene Goodman, but investigators could not corroborate that. Relatives told authorities Erica's grandmother is dead, and authorities could find no evidence that a woman named Irene Goodman even exists. Her parents went to federal prison in 2014 for having accepted benefits in Erica's name long after her disappearance. Sandy Parsons, Erica's adoptive father, led authorities to her remains in Chesterfield County, South Carolina in September 2016 near the home of Sandy's mother between the towns of Pageland and Mount Krogan. Before the discovery, detectives recovered items in the search of a shed on property belonging to Sandy himself. The items recovered include a videotape, a hammer, teeth, and school records. This is a do-over of the previous sentence because Walter was making a noise. Before the discovery, detectives recovered items in the search of a shed on property belonging to Sandy himself, including a videotape, a hammer, teeth, 
and school records. The Charlotte Observer reported in 2014 on the extensive abuse Erica allegedly suffered in the Parsons' home. Her older brother, James, now 21, said he and the other children routinely abused the girl, who was 13 when she disappeared. He once broke her arm. Quote, I would hit her, physically abuse her, fists, belts, James Parsons said under oath in 2014. He said he abused the girl from the time he was age five and stopped when he was 16. Quote, I didn't want to hit her no more. I couldn't stand it, unquote. He said his mother, Casey, encouraged the other children to abuse Erica too. And he saw his mother beating Erica frequently. Quote, she would beat her with a belt if she didn't listen. Mama would bend her fingers back, unquote. Once Casey Parsons put Erica's hand in a cast because her fingers had been broken. The child was never taken to the hospital, her brother said. Quote, Dad would hit her with his fist on top of her head. At one point, the girl developed a bald spot because of scabbing. Food was often withheld from Erica as a punishment. If she'd steal a cookie or something else to eat, she'd be fed canned dog food by her adoptive mother, Casey. This happened once or twice a month, her brother told authorities. Erica was also often locked in a closet in the various homes the family lived in. Sometimes she would be beaten for relieving herself in those closets. Sheriff Kevin Auten said at a news conference on Monday, October 3rd, that he believes Erica Parsons was dead long before she was reported missing in 2013. The sheriff said no one has been charged in Erica's death yet. And he also said that uh, Sandy was not offered any kind of plea deal or promise in return for showing investigators to Erica's grave site. Uh, the medical examiner uh, is performing their investigation and they have not yet completed it or released their findings, but I will update you when they do. Um, I suspect, and I'm sure you do too, that we will see charges against the Parsons for the murder of their adopted daughter. Uh, very soon. And I'll be sure to include uh, links to the articles that uh, I used in researching this case in the show notes, and I'll also include the video um, from the, the news conference. And at the end of this episode, I'm going to include a couple of minutes of uh, audio from that news conference, because I think it's, it's important to hear. The resource for this episode is actually a website called The Lost and the Found. Uh, the news publication, uh, the news publication Reveal, which is a production by the Center for Investigative Reporting, has developed a website uh, that they call The Lost and the Found, which is uh, a side-by-side sort of two-in-one comparison tool. Uh, that shows the databases of the national databases of missing persons and of unidentified decedents. And the tool, um, to which obviously I'll include a link in the show notes, and, and I'll also include a link to a really good article uh, by the folks at Reveal uh, about the, pro- the problem in the ways, the, the many ways that the nation is sort of failing the missing and the unidentified dead. Um, it, but Reveal has a podcast as well. They have, uh, it's not always about true crime, but they do cover this tool. Uh, and they, they do have an episode about uh, an, a reporter going undercover to work for a private prison. And that's a very fascinating insight into um, the criminal justice system in the United States. Um, so again, the tool is called the Lost and the Found. It's already enabled uh, several individuals who uh, were uh, found dead and unable to be identified. It's already enabled them to be uh, sadly identified as uh, people who have been missing for some time. But um, while it is sad, it's always sad when uh, somebody that you're hoping will be found alive is found dead. Uh, it does 
give uh, some sense of closure to their loved ones, and just as importantly, I gives law enforcement a uh, a new sense of uh, where to go uh, to solve the case, and 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 often will also get the, the story back out into the press, which can both be good in bringing in leads and be good in sort of renewing uh, some pressure both internally and externally on investigators to make sure that they find the perpetrators of these, these crimes. Okay, this episode's cold case is the case of Scarlett Keeling. Um, I need more time on this case to give it uh, the, the kind of full coverage that it deserves. Uh, the case is far more complex than I thought. There are two autopsies, allegations of government conspiracy, questions about the investigation, and even a Bollywood movie about the case. To top it all off, there's two entries worth of material over at WikiLeaks, um, and there'll be links to both of those in the show notes, and I'll be hosting as many of those files as I can uh, get onto my server. Um, what I'm going to do today is give you a very compressed timeline of the events before and surrounding what I think was a murder. And uh, ideally I'll talk more about this case in the future, either by interviewing somebody with a more direct knowledge of it, or getting uh, a friend on to discuss it with, because it's really so, so complicated. And, uh, you know, almost a 10 year old case at this point. And, and I think it's important to do Scarlet the justice she deserves. Uh, you know, to do my small part by at least discussing it in the kind of depth that I think we really need to, to give it. Um, so this is going to be a timeline of the case. It's going to be truncated. It's going to be relatively brief. Um, there's going to be big jumps, and there's going to be details. If you're the kind of person who, uh, you know, goes on Reddit looking for true crime or is a member of the Web Sleuth Forum, um, you're going you're gonna to notice that a lot of things that you may know about the Scarlet Keeling case are missing from this timeline. I know. Um, I do know. I want to, again, come back to the case in the future with uh, more in-depth coverage. But I really want, because it's still a cold case, and, and you'll understand why uh, when I'm done with this segment, I, I want to get the timeline out there. So, November 2007. 15-year-old Scarlett Keeling goes on holiday with her mother, her mother's boyfriend, and her seven siblings and half-siblings. They go on a six-month trip that included India. Uh, now that, uh, at the outset, sounds like a, an awesome vacation uh, to me, as long as you get along with your, your many siblings and half-siblings. So that's November 2007. A few months later, February 18th, 2008, at 3 a.m., Scarlett Keeling is seen by multiple eyewitnesses entering Louis' shack, or Louis's shack, on, and that, that's not a man's shack that he lives in. That's a, that's, there's a lot of bars on the beach uh, in Anjuna uh, that are called shacks. Uh, it's just kind of like, I don't know if it's a brand name or sort of a generic name for a bar. Uh, but she, Scarlett is seen February 18, 2008, 3 a.m. by multiple eyewitnesses entering Lewis's shack on Anjuna Beach in the Indian state of Goa. Later in the day, on February 18th, so this is, you know, after sunrise, Scarlett is found dead not far from where she was last seen on Anjuna Beach. Dr. Silvano Sepeco performed an autopsy which found five wounds on her body, and while police inspector Nerlin Albuquerque, and yes, it sounds like a fake name, it's not. Um, that's the guy's name. Police inspector Nerlin Albuquerque told the press that it was an accidental drowning death. Um, 
but Dr. Sapeco said that he raised concerns. He raised the possibility of homicide to police, uh, but they seemed, in his opinion, to ignore him. February 21st, Scarlett's mother, Fiona McEwen, began approaching locals for information about her daughter's death. Uh, she was bluntly told by one local in uh, or around Anjuna Beach that it was widely assumed Scarlett had been raped and murdered. On her way to the police station, Fiona McEwen found her daughter's bikini bottom, torn sandals, and shorts lying unnoticed on the beach, which immediately raised her doubts about the quality of the police investigation, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, Fiona and her lawyer would later examine her daughter's body and find 52 wounds on Scarlett's body, more than 10 times the amount of wounds the initial autopsy uh, described. So that was February 21st. Five days later, February 26, 2008, Fiona and her lawyer asked the Goa chief minister to make a criminal investigation of the matter. Despite an initial refusal, two days later, the state gave in to media pressure and granted the request. March 4th, 2008, two Indian national officials demanded the investigation be done over again from the start. March 22nd, a second autopsy was performed at Fiona McEwen's uh, insistence. And it resulted in the recommendation of a homicide investigation. Uh, the second autopsy found signs of sandy water in Scarlett's lungs, which suggested drowning in shallow water, and also found indications of sexually motivated violence or rape. And I make the distinction here just because there, it does seem obvious when you look at the evidence that the public has access to that there was some kind of sexually motivated violence. Um, it's unclear and, and probably, judging by the quality of the initial investigation, impossible to determine whether there was actually rape because that's going to involve, obviously, uh, the kind of testing done in a rape kit. It's going to involve swapping for potential semen. It's going to involve um, searching for certain injuries. Um, usually tearing at the vaginal wall and, and other injuries that are indicative of an actual rape. Um, but it is clear that there was, at the very least, some kind of sexually motivated uh, violence uh, that befell Scarlet. So that was March 22nd. March 23rd, uh, the day after the second autopsy results were released with a homicide investigation recommendation, Samson D'Souza was arrested based on eyewitness reports that he was the last person seen with Charlotte. Uh, at the end of March, Placido Carvalho, who was also seen with Scarlet the night before she was found dead, is arrested. June 2008, June 5th, 2008, the case was transferred from local police in Goa to India's Central Bureau of Investigation. And that is essentially the Indian equivalent of the FBI. October 2009, so now we've jumped from June 5th, 2008, when the case is, is turned over to the CBI. Um, we jump all the way to October 2009. Uh, CBI charged the suspects that were previously arrested, Samson D'Souza and Placido Carvalho, with culpable homicide, which is similar to a manslaughter charge in the U.S. Um, the CBI accused them of, quote, deliberately leaving Scarlet near the waterline on the sea beach, knowing that she was fully intoxicated, unquote, as well as uh, sexual assault and attempting to conceal the crime. The failure to charge murder, which the CBI blamed on, on the botched initial investigation, uh, left Scarlet's mother, Fiona McEwen, quote, floored. March 3rd, 2010, the trial began. It was delayed by the limit of uh, hearings only once monthly due to the court's major backlog and frequent changes in the presiding judges. And so those extensive delays 
uh, produce a massive gap between March 3rd, 2010 and September 23rd, 2016, when we have the two suspects, Samson D'Souza and Placido Carvalho, declared not guilty of all charges um, and subsequently released from custody, um, leaving Scarlett's mother, Fiona, uh, at a loss um, and, frankly, angry. So I'm going to include a link to the telegraph.co.uk um, article called Scarlett Keeling, how the tragic case of the 15-year-old's death unfolded. Uh, the whole timeline comes from that really well-reported and extensive story. Um, and I'm going to keep an eye on this because, again, I'm including it as the cold case here because, you know, assuming that these men are innocent, which, you know, we're compelled to do, and I'm especially compelled to do, being that I'm an attorney and I, um, I try to put my faith in the system whenever possible. I understand that there are, there are frequently mistakes, and frankly, you know, you're going to look at the evidence I'm going to post along with this episode, and you're probably going to wonder if, if two guilty men didn't just get away with murder. Um, but as of right now, there are no additional suspects, there are no additional arrests, there are no additional charges, and as, as far as I'm concerned, and hopefully as far as uh, the CBI India is concerned, this is an open case. Um, and, you know, Scarlet deserves... She deserves, her family deserves the truth, and she deserves a voice, and she can't tell us who killed her. And the evidence, to me, is, is quite strong that somebody did kill her. And so hopefully we, we will find that out in the future. All right, that, um, that brings us to the conclusion of Episode 5 of True Crime Review. Thanks again for listening and for bearing with me through the continuing growing pains. Um, I sincerely hope you'll give me your comments, your criticisms, and maybe even some compliments. Hint, hint. Um, but seriously, share the podcast with your friends, anybody that you know that you think is interested or may be interested in true crime. Um, you know, not only would I love to impress uh, people who are already really obsessed with uh, true crime, but I would like to get people who maybe aren't into it yet uh, interested in it because, you know, again, I think it's really, it's really important and I think it's, it's a unique feature of modern technology and media that we can all kind of unite on Reddit and Web Sleuths and, you know, through these podcasts and uh, try to help find some answers in these cases. So you can find us on Twitter at True Crime R-E-V and that's True Crime R-E-V. Everywhere else on social media you can find us as True Crime Review. We're on Facebook, we're on uh, Google Plus, we're on Instagram, uh, we're on Pinterest, we're on Tumblr. Uh, we're having particular fun on Instagram Although fun may be the, the wrong word, considering we're, we are covering some pretty horrible stuff over there. Um, but, but I say fun because we're, again, it's a great way to connect with you all. And there's a lot of other podcasters on there, too. We were especially excited to see uh, the guys at Generation Y repost uh, our recent recommendation that people give them a listen, which in retrospect is, is kind of hilarious that a brand new podcast um, with maybe a couple hundred listeners, if we're lucky, uh, telling people to go listen to Gen Y. I think Gen Y is, is pretty high up there when it comes to, to iTunes rankings, for example. But they reposted our recommendation of them, which was super cool and obviously not something that they had to do. Um, so find us on social media, say hello, send an email to podcast to True Crime Review. Uh, thanks for listening, and remember, we do this because families deserve the truth, and victims deserve voices. This has been Episode 5 of True Crime Review.
the remains of Eric Parsons were located in a shallow grave just outside of Pageham. And it's not, it was not on any property rented or owned by any of the Parsons family members. This location was processed by the agents on the scene. The skeletonized human remains were then transported to the North Carolina Medical Examiner's Office for identification examination. On Friday morning, September the 30th, they confirmed absolutely those were the remains of Erica Parsons. We believe through this investigation that Erica was deceased long before she was even reported missing. Unfortunately, we never had a chance to find her alive, which was always our goal and, and our hope. Second, I want to clear up one thing. There have been no pleas, no agreements, no, no promises, anything to anybody that may or may become a suspect in this case. Nobody has been promised one thing. We're not in a position to do that, and it hadn't been done. And the, the really, the burning question I know is, when is somebody gonna be arrested? Well, that's where we are in hopes that the medical examiner will soon give us information that'll lead us to the decision on what and what charges are appropriate, the most appropriate. Please understand this has been a very tough, difficult case for us. Everybody involved in this case has children. And uh, it touches you. I was there at the graveside. Her, her body was uh, recovered, and, and I'll tell you, there's some pretty tough officers had a pretty tough time. It's, it, it's one on all of us, and uh, we're getting there. We're not where we want to be with this case. We're glad to have found Erica. We're going to get her to a good resting spot, and then we're going to continue to seek justice with these partners that I mentioned and these folks that are up here with me. We're going to see this case through and, and get it finished. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for all your coverage of this story, and it, it, it is an important story. Thank you.